Hey, what's up everyone? This is another Anatomy of a Hustler. I'm your host, Cope. Janice can't be with us today, but if you're listening to this sweet, sweet audio, shout out to Janice. She uh, upgraded the equipment. So thank you, Janice. Sorry you couldn't be here to break them in. But what we do get to break in with is my buddy, Micah. Uh, He is the founding chapter lead, chapter, how how do I describe our relationship? I know, I know. Oh man, okay. Let's just start with the one we met with. Okay, we met... Um, a few years ago when I was the chapter founder and organizer of Fuck Up Nights Sacramento. Um, Fuck Up Nights being a global speaker organization that has uh, 320 chapters around the world. Um, and I'm the one that started and ran the Sacramento chapter. So brought it to Sacramento, but you know, the original organization started in Mexico City in 2012. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, for people that don't know you, why don't you give us a little bit of background? Tell me a little bit about <laughs> your, your story, what brought you here, some of your various hustles and uh, journeys, and maybe yeah. if you want to share a failure, I'll probably jump in there too. Oh, yeah. But yeah, why don't you start as far back as uh, feels comfortable and give people some context as to what brought you here? <laughs> um, well, let's see. A long time ago, I was a young boy in Wisconsin and um, had undiagnosed, untreated ADD in mm. school, um, which has a lot of pros and a lot of cons, um, but I was really attracted to all of the creative classes. So I took a lot of art classes. I took a lot of creative writing classes. I took all of this stuff that over the course of my career would become content creation. Mm. Um, and so in college, after bouncing around majors a couple of times, I discovered graphic design, um, which is just, it, it, it scratched all of my artistic itch and all of my like borderline OCD preciseness and perfectionism. Mm. Um, so it was a, an amazing combination of those two things. Uh, fast forward 20 years, I've had a uh, crazy career that's all over the place with a lot of random side hustles thrown in. Like while I was moonlighting as a graphic designer, I was uh, an au pair in Paris for a year. I worked at a scuba diving shop in Milwaukee. Uh, I was a summer camp counselor. I was a sailboat instructor in Wisconsin as well. Um, but still doing graphic design on the side and developing my skills and developing my, um, uh, I guess side skills too, because like, you know, graphic design being the main core of it, but then learning photography, uh, learning copywriting, learning package design, learning social media marketing. Right. And, you know, so if you're doing something for 20 years, you're going to start creating this like entire ecosystem rather than just that singular skill. Gotcha. Um, uh, in 2018, went through a uh, incredibly ugly surprise divorce, um, and sort of got shaken up there, and then um, got laid off of a creative director job that I had at the time. Mm. Um, and in sort of scrambling and reorienting myself, uh, somebody told me about Fuck Up Nights, and I was like, "Oh my God, that sounds like the coolest organization!" You know, especially because, like I said, I had that uh, that wicked streak of perfectionism and self doubt, and like being really hard on myself. Yeah. And, um, the creative curse. The, yeah, the creative curse and, and finding a lot of um, uh, examples where I would like want to do something but then freeze and procrastinate and say like, well, why do I have this like visceral gut reaction that is holding me back from doing something? Mm. So when I uh, learned about Fuck Up Nights, um, I was just like incredibly drawn to it. And I watched a bunch of videos online of their uh, events that they held in different chapters. Mm-hmm. And then when I looked to see when the next local show is going to be, they're like, well, Sacramento doesn't have a fuck up nights. Um, You know, and they had their little spiel, their little pitch for saying, well, you You could bring it it to Sacramento. Um, And it sounded like the perfect thing for me with all the the experience that I had. Yeah. Um, And so brought it to Sacramento um, through four events, did a lot of social media, did a lot of uh, hustling and, and, and putting stuff together and got just a phenomenal response. Um, and things were really chugging along and all this stuff was happening and then COVID happened Yep. and killed it dead. Um, and so rather than, you know, hang around in Sacramento for too long through COVID, uh, I decided that, um, you know, I might as well explore the U S. Uh, so I sold my house, bought a camper van, uh, have been road tripping around the U S mm. Um, still side hustling on graphic design and doing that kind of stuff, but really just having a lot of me time and a lot of development. Um, but then also got the idea for a patent for a consumer electronic product, uh, in the therapeutic field. So I 
learned the process of how to patent things and I'm currently working with a patent lawyer and we just got our first response from the US Patent and Trademark Office. So I'm going down that rabbit hole. But then also um, decided to pick up a project that started during fuck up nights, mm. um, which is actually writing a book and curating uh, information from experts about the fear of failure and why it happens and you know treatment and and different ways to uh, look at it very cool so yeah and so like we talked about just a little bit before um that turned into well i kind of always wanted to go backpack asia so i should go do that right because what better way to write a book about failure than to (laughs) travel across the world yeah travel across the world and add uh, the element of cultural aspects right and say well how do different cultures view and respond to the fear of failure along with, you know, psychology, physiology, um, philosophy, uh, childhood development, um, evolution, evolutionary biology. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many amazing facets to look at this through. Oh yeah. And so I want to explore all the, the nerdier, more technical, more scientific things of why does it happen in the first place and not just do the cheerleading rah, rah, you know, mindset coaching of like, well, here's, you know, have you tried just doing it anyway? Right, right. Um, have you tried checklists? Yeah, have, exactly. And, you know, especially uh, spending decades with untreated ADD and getting all of that, like, mm-hmm. phenomenal advice. Mm-hmm. Have you considered just not being a little twerp, you know, twerp <laughs> and just doing it anyway? Or? No, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't maybe you need a better that. calendar. Right. And, yeah, so actually drilling down into why something happens is actually a, a tremendous coping me- or a tremendously valuable thing for me. Because once I understand why something's happening, right. I recognize it pretty quickly and then I can choose to do it differently. Gotcha. But, but it takes that recognition and the recognition takes the education of knowing what's happening in the first place. Right, right. So it's kind of drilling back that, you know, three, four, five levels deep. Yeah, and I'm sure during that time of your uh, ADHD being undiagnosed, you're probably just kind of looking around like, well, I want to understand, I want to yeah. fit, I want to get it. Yeah, and then the incredible frustration of like, <clears throat> why can't I just do the thing? Yeah. Why are all the other kids like making this look pretty easy? Right. Like, why can they do their homework and I right. can't? Or why can they uh, not lose things? Or why do they not forget yeah. things? And I'm just like, maybe it's because I suck. Yeah. And, just, you know, especially back then, if you're a kid and you don't know, um, it, it's pretty crazy and traumatic and disorienting because you have no idea why you're different or why you can't do it right so that's fascinating to me that uh, you still stuck through a path that you wound up in more school and more school but i guess maybe that's it you were trying to understand the why and still pursuing and wanting to get a deeper grasp of life at some level yeah i think there's still um i mean it's still really really fun i mean one of the great things about add in particular is um when you're interested in something you're you know, you hyper focus, you're fascinated by it. Right. Um, and if you're, you know, relatively intelligent and curious and love learning and are so interested in the world around you and how everything works, um, once you start pointing that focus on yourself and saying like, well, how do I work? You know, uh, when you start learning about psychology and learning all these things and realizing how that stuff actually affects your brain and how that affects your life right. and makes it easier or harder. And then you start learning about physiology and the nervous system and you're like, Oh, wow, well, God, this is all amazing how this all plugs together. It's like doing a puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, you know, d- it definitely, rather than just uh, being something that is, you know, relevant to me and how I got here. It's also just this like fascinating puzzle that I'm having a blast. You're learning the cheat on. code and how to unlock your own superpowers. Yeah, and that's the actually one of the really cool things is that um, as I'm learning this stuff, it's fascinating, but um, I've had a relatively, not easy time, because it's, it's been very challenging, but I've, I've been successful in internalizing and incorporating the things that I'm learning. So I'm noticing um, relatively dramatic effects and growth, and mm. it's, it's pretty good. I'm, I'm significantly more... Uh, self-aware and chill and have healthy perspective like much more than I was you know even five six seven eight years ago but definitely leaps and bounds over when I was younger yeah it sounds like it sounds like it so I'm going to take it back just a little bit because you talked about a couple of these different jobs that you had while you were also still moonlighting as a designer Mm -hmm. Um, so 
what was it that you said, ah, I'm going to keep this as a side hustle? Was it just because you weren't necessarily ready to make that leap into doing design full time? Like, Yeah. Um, I think there was a lot of discomfort and second guessing of saying like, all right, well, you know, I have uh, a talent for this. It's mm -hmm. something that I was good at pretty quickly. And especially because um, graphic design is a career path that is more portfolio based than sure. resume based. Sure. Um, you know, so I had a good portfolio, but it was just that squeamishness of saying like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not good enough to be a real designer. Mm. But then also getting sidetracked by stuff like, you know, working in a scuba diving shop is pretty cool. Yeah. And um, the living in Paris thing, um, I was dating a girl and she was like, well, I'm going to go study abroad in Paris. You can come with me if you want. And I'm like, well, hot damn, of course. Yeah. Like, absolutely. I'm not going to say no yes. to that. So, right. um, uh, but always finding ways. Like, I did freelance graphic design when I was in Paris. Um, when I was the uh, full-time sailing instructor, mm -hmm. uh, I was also the PR and marketing chair of the club and also moonlighting design outside of that. Um, so, you know, definitely capitalizing on the design, but yeah. just not making it my my gotcha. main priority at that time okay all right and then what at that time what was your metric for success for oh, that hustle um the metric of success that i had was just am i making enough to feel comfortable and not be stressed about bills hmm um, a very uh, lofty and reasonable pursuit. Yeah, <laughs> like like very lofty and reasonable. I was I was much more focused on quality of life um, mm -hmm. than I was on saying like, well, I'm going to be the best designer in in the city that I'm in, or um, you know, I need to make enough money to buy a nice car to impress girls. It's right. really just like um, I feel successful when life flows, and I don't even think about how much money I have in my account. Yeah, which is easy because I'm, you know, relatively low maintenance. I'm yeah. not a, um, I don't know, a flashy guy by any means. Right. So it, it makes it easy if I can live my life and go out and hang out with friends and go on dates and do things, um, with a relative level of comfort that I have enough in my account to justify that, then I. That's all the success that I'm really looking for. Got it. I was going to ask if that was something that you learned along the way, or is this just kind of uh, ingrained <clears throat> in your natural personality? Uh, something I learned along the way, gotcha. for sure. So, um, you know, my, my parents, um, they were very poor uh, when I was young. Mm. Um, they both dropped out of college when they had me. Uh, and seeing them struggle and then work through their careers. And, and, you know, my, like my dad has a work ethic that I just can't understand. Hmm. Um, but like I said, I, you know, as a kid with undi uh, undiagnosed ADD, um, I, I struggled mightily through my high school and all through my twenties. And it wasn't until I got diagnosed when I was 30 and started uh, getting my feet under me and my career really started taking off mm. um, because I was just a little too unorganized and a little too scattered brained mm -hmm. uh, before that. Um, so I think that the that particular metric was was beaten into me by my experience through my 20s of just like financially struggling, always being worried about finances, always being weirded out if I was going to have enough work coming up. Mm -hmm. um, but also being, you know, struggling with those ADD things of um, not having the organizational skills to really keep work flowing in the way that I wanted it to. And that was going to be my next question yeah. is how did you handle lead flow? Because side hustles are cool, but... Yeah. If you're not actually doing any fucking work, it's just a <laughs> hobby, right? Like yeah. if there's no clients in the pipeline, it's like, cool, this is an idea. Yeah, it's cool having graphic design on a business card, but unless right. you're actually designing, what's what's happening? Um, the nice thing was is that uh, the sailing club, like once I started getting pretty good at design, mm -hmm. um, like I would go to networking events. I would network within the club. Um, the merchandise, you know, it's a seventeen hundred person sailing club, mm. um, and everybody knew that I was the designer and designed merchandise and stuff. And people are like, "Hot damn, where'd this come from?" Yeah. And so everybody knew that Micah was a designer. Um, and so I did start getting a decent amount of work flowing in. 
Um, and then I think at that time, I also got a part-time job in the athletic department um, designing uh, game programs and merchandise for the Wisconsin Badgers. Mm-hmm. Like I worked in the basement of the stadium and, you know, did the cups that they served beer in in the stadium. It was, oh, it was pretty cool. cool. It was rad. That's really um, cool. And as I built my portfolio and had all of these examples of like, you know, well done, crisp, professional designs, um, I had to market less and less. Yeah. But at the same time, so here's here's the thing that I still understand about myself, um, and especially at the time, I didn't have to market, and so I always had enough work coming in to have that baseline level of comfort. Yep. But my bar is pretty low. Mm-hmm. You know, and so if I would have been uh, a person that had a different mindset, like, well, I want to be the best designer in the city, or I want to make this much per year, mm-hmm. or like I I have this other baseline of success, I would not have been satisfied at that point, And I would have hustled a lot harder. Sure. Um, and so, you know, as I get older, I definitely have that uh, mindset of, all right, baseline's cool, but what about my future? What about planning? What about uh, nest egging and um, having a, a slightly bigger vision than just being able to like relax and take a breather and not right. being stressed. Right. Um, so over the last 10 years, that has been the development that I've focused on more mm. is saying, how do I do something that has a grander um, forward vision? Like what's scalable? What is um, something that I'm passionate about, but still can, you know, be more than it is like, like what can grow um, exponentially? Yeah. And so that's actually started leading me to fuck up nights to, you know, why we fear failure, my, my new venture. Yep. Um, and the patent uh, for that lamp that I mentioned. Um, these are things that I can support with graphic design. Sure. And my content creation and technical drafting and all, you know, all the stuff I do. But I am not like if these things take off, I'm not uh, choked by my, my own bandwidth. Gotcha. So, okay. All right. I dig that. I think that not enough people take into account that having a job is absolutely a networking opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that you putting yourself in that position is a good reminder for people that are like, oh, well, how do I find it? It's like, well, are you vocal about your hustle? Are Mm -hmm. you vocal about your skills? Are you willing to put yourself out there? Because I think that that's something that I definitely struggled with as a creative as well, which Mm -hmm. was like, yeah, I can do this, but I also had like a wealth of talent other than that one thing that Mm -hmm. I was kind of like labeling myself as. And it took someone to kind of push me in a direction that I was uncomfortable with for Mm -hmm. me to realize like, oh, there's something here and oh, there's opportunity here. And Mm -hmm. it always came from that level of uh, discomfort and just by doing. But I think it's a really underrated resource to to not look to your left and right, depending on your Mm -hmm. circumstance and see like, okay, you can identify as something else other than that just nine to five or or whatever. Yeah. And then, um, you know, like I said, I was the marketing and PR chair for the sailing club, which Mm -hmm. was not a paid position. That's some, you know, those were all volunteer hours. Right. But I was volunteering, putting my design and copywriting and social media management and illustration into an arena where lots of people were seeing it. It was all portfolio building, Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't getting paid for it. So I, I love that I got to do that and um, do high profile, splashy, interesting, you know, pieces um, in a way that sort of like, oh, I'm going to shit the crib right here on brain wise. No worries. Um, I love that I was able to find ways to volunteer mm-hmm. that helped me build my portfolio and expand my network and, you know, get higher profile gigs. Um, even though it was a volunteer opportunity. Right. So that was just like an amazing way to, uh, invest my time and resources. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the sailing club is one of my favorite examples of doing that, but I think there's probably uh, 10 or a dozen different organizations that I've worked for, mm. for the same reason. Um, whether it's a nonprofit and I'm volunteering design, but I know that it's a large nonprofit. Right. Um, or if I see a client that has a, uh, 
you know, particularly active uh, community, mm -hmm. um, I'll bid low because I know that there's a lot of value that is not really spoken. So it's almost right. like um, bidding on a project and saying, well, what's my total compensation for this project? And realizing that um, I know that underpaying for designers for exposure yep. is some bullshit. Yep. And I had to do, I had to put up with a lot of that when I was younger. Yep. But now that I'm older, I can look at a specific project and say like, I'm comfortable doing it for this much. They still are respecting my skills. They're still paying me, but I'm going to leverage other parts of their network right. for my own benefit. Uh, and that there's a couple different things I want to jump on, but the idea of using a, a paid gig, even if it's maybe a little bit lower than mm -hmm. what you would like to be at <clears throat> with the understanding that there's a networking opportunity, I think some people fall in that, uh, that restrictive mindset of thinking like, no, this is my value. This is my worth. And that's cool. If Which the, is healthy. Sure. It, it's, it's a thing that I struggle with because I understand both sides of it. But, yep. uh, do you know the website? Uh, I think it's called nospec.com. I have not or heard no of that org. Um, it is just in long, deep detail about how spec work is really damaging. Mm. And so, but I, I also feel like spec work is different than taking a slightly lower pay for a gig in exchange for, and that's the thing is like, you know, every contract is a negotiation. Sure. So you can say, all right, well, you can pay me less if that's your budget, but let's look at your soft costs. Right. Let's look, you know. I want you to, sh you know, shout me out on these things. I want you to add me to this. I want you to in invite me to this event. I want right. you, like, this is what I want in exchange for that lower price. Right. And so treating it as an, um, uh, a negotiation chip and mm. not just saying, oh, well, you know, I'm going to do spec work because I'm going to do something for free. Right. And then, and then you really are devaluing yourself. I think that there's there's a certain point that you need to stop being the cheap or stop being the free mm -hmm. and realize that, okay, if I never step out of portfolio building phase, then you're do, doing yourself a disservice totally. and the industry at large. And I think being able to make that uncomfortable switch, because it is for, for like someone it's like me, it was very uncomfortable yeah. to assign a value to something where I would attach my heart to it in a lot of cases. Right. Mm -hmm. So I stopped wanting to do wedding photography because I was like, damn, I can't charge shit for this. Cause I'm like yeah. so passionate about it. But the market that I was in at the time, like wasn't able to sustain it. Mm -hmm. But I commend you for seeing the opportunity, knowing that there was the long-term payoff because it's easy to get wrapped up in that trap. Yeah. And I, I think as I was doing that transition mm -hmm. and you know, because your, your client base sort of comes along with your own growth. Like when you're a young designer, you're working with other people that are starting businesses that are working with like zero, you know, very low budgets right. or they're, they're trying to get something off the ground for as cheap as possible. And then as you get better and better clients, their budgets grow and their understanding of what the relationship is grows. But there's that weird, uncomfortable middle area mm -hmm. where you have people that are you know, their hustle is starting to go well, your hustle is starting to go well, and you want to work together, but are they able to adequately compensate you for the work that you're doing? And there, you know, that's where there's some um, disparity. And yeah, so I really got the mindset of like, I'm looking at total compensation package, which can be much more than just money. Right. So uh, I did work for some restaurants and I was like, all right, you're going to pay me this much cash, but you're going to give me this much gift certificate. Right. Because I like your restaurant. I support what you're doing. I want to bring my friends here and, and you know, help you advertise word of mouth. Yep. But you need to understand that this total compensation package is what I'm worth, but we can get pretty creative with uh, how that is actually paid out. Cash and trade. I love it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's the same thing like, oh, I'm going to design for, um, you know, an old motorcycle or something and you're like, well, I didn't actually get paid anything, but now I have this motorcycle. And right. It's pretty cool. Right. So is that a story you have? Uh, I mean, I did have an old rusty motorcycle, but it wasn't through a design deal, Damn. but I've gotten, I've gotten some other things, you know, like that, uh, recording equipment, um, musical equipment, um, some, you know, design and electronics stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I love barter. Barter is yeah, my favorite. Barter is so much fun. And I think that's an opportunity where you can say, how, how do I make my compensation package 
adequate for what I need. Right. But I'm not hitting them directly in the pocketbook because, you know, maybe they are trying their best. Maybe they do have a fixed budget for the project, you know, but they have something cool laying around that they're not using. Right. So. Right. I love trading with uh, other people that run businesses when it makes sense because, you know, yeah, you only... can't just say like, oh, well, now I have a pile of of shitty t-shirts that I don't want. Right. It has right. to be something that you actually benefit from. 100%. 100% that, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to also go back a little bit to uh, to Fuck Up Nights because oh, yeah. it didn't even click to me. And I've known you, and that's how I knew you, was through Fuck Up Nights. Uh-huh. You had never been to an actual Fuck Up Nights before you decided you were going to bring it to SAC? Was it just like no, videos? it was and- just videos. <laughs> Because all the uh, all the chapters that were nearby weren't really doing that much. Wow. The Sacramento oh the Sacramento chapter didn't exist. The San Francisco chapter was dead. The Oakland chapter had one like two months from. Yeah, I was just like fuck it, I can do this. I've, um, you know, that's another thing about, you know, I was a musician when I was younger, and then um, as a marketing and PR chair of the Sailing Club, like I am extremely comfortable being on a stage in front of people. Sure. So, the entire format of fuck up nights was. Like, none of this is intimidating to me. Yeah. Um, if anything, it's the opposite. It's actually pretty exciting. Um, yeah. And so the the new project, the Why We For Failure, like, I'm, I know I'm traveling and, like, doing the book, but at the same time, when I come back to the U.S., I'm like, well, maybe it'd be kind of cool to see if there's a way to fit that format into it again. Too, right. And do um, more public-facing, event-based. But who knows? I mean, that's, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Right, right. So what are you going to use as your metric of success for why we feel, why we fear failure? (laughs) Um, That's a great question because I feel like there's so many different variables at play. I mean, Mm -hmm. this, this really is like, I've turned this into a business trip, but then there's still, I'm trying to do this as personally fulfilling and as adventurous as possible. Mm -hmm. So there's the metric of, am I having crazy enlightening unexpected spontaneous experiences Mm. am i am i surviving comfortably and not just miserable and you know am i dying of malaria in a third world country (laughs) um hope not hope not um but the why we for failure in specific uh my metric of success for this is are people genuinely resonating with this and interested um and so you know i can use followers on social media and all of that um am i able to get interviews with the type of experts that i'm looking for right for um you know both the podcast but then also i want them to be um people that i reference in the book Mm. um like i want i want psychologists and um physiologists and and um all of these experts to be like genuinely interested in this and say like oh wow this is a really creative way of looking at this and putting it all together. And I would love to be part of this. I would love to support this. Yeah. Um, and with that, I mean, if it does generate that kind of interest, then naturally there will be a uh, financial interest sure. too. So can I get sponsorships? Can I get backing? Can I get um, advertising revenue? Like, can I monetize in this in the way kind of, like I said earlier, it's, it's almost honestly the same metric as when I was young. Can I travel this way? for years through all of these countries and afford to do it in a way that is sustainably comfortable and fulfilling. Mm. Um, if I can manage to spend two or three years traveling around the entire world and going into any country that I want and being able to afford a decent hotel and being able to afford a decent meal, um, and getting interviews with people that I am genuinely excited to, to interview and talk to, that's that is a successful world tour oh yeah sounds like a Um, great metric to me yeah and then i'll be i'll be writing as i travel so um you know i'm going to keep a close eye on what my output on that is um but also with that like as i i want to build a team as i go so if i have a literary agent or an editor or somebody that i can i can write and send it off to them and they're like all right this is pretty good but we're going to tailor it this way and then we're going to make sure that we're heading this direction um just so i don't feel like i'm traveling around the world with my head in a pail and I come back and there's nothing actually useful that occurred (laughs) over the trip, you know? So having, having some feedback is good. Right. Um, but you know, this is also a spiritual journey for myself and, um, part of my own healing and growing and, uh, 
working through trauma. And I think one of the cool things about the trip is that I, I have this like full awareness and anticipation that I'm leaving to do something that's kind of crazy and it's going to take years mm -hmm. and I'm not going to be the same person when I come back. Oh, so, um, the other day I went for a, a walk with Ernesto Ciroli, who was mm -hmm. one of my speakers at fuck up nights. And we had this incredible conversation. Um, and a lot of it centered around the, the whole metaphor of, you know, a caterpillar becoming a chrysalis, becoming a butterfly. Mm -hmm. And the caterpillar doesn't know what it's doing. Mm. The caterpillar doesn't know why it's making a cocoon. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, it dissolves into goo inside, uh, completely loses any and all orientation and awareness of itself. And then somehow magically becomes this butterfly. Um, and it's that metaphor of like having the self-awareness of being like, I'm a caterpillar. I'm building a cocoon. This is going to get fucking weird. Yeah. This is going to get real weird. And I know I'm going to be different at the end of it, but, um, um, uh, making sure that I, I lean into the discomfort and I'm doing things as I'm on this trip that are those, those growth opportunities, those crazy experiences, those those things that are soul enriching and fulfilling. Mm. Like I have to make sure that it's that kind of trip that even beca uh, that comes before the book that comes sure. before the podcast. Like if this isn't a world trip for myself first, then, you know, the rest of it's fun, but like to what purpose I'm going to, I'm right. going to come back here and I'm still going to be, you know, not fully, I mean, <laughs> What is it? I mean, it's not hat pupated. No, hatched. Uh, I'm not sure. Come on, Cope. What, what's, what's a butterfly when it crawls out of the? A the fucking chrysalis? a fucking badass. <laughs> I don't know the appropriate I know, scientific right. there's, terminology. There's, no. Somebody knows. Right, right. Clay, pupa. 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 When they come out, maybe. Maybe someone will have to. <laughs> someone will have to leave it in the somebody comments if we're that. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's a, that's a beautiful beautiful journey and a beautiful metric of success yeah. and i commend you for being willing to step out not that this is foreign to you for you to just step out in the unknown and it's kind of crazy yeah i mean it's, it's still uncomfortable but it's not as uncomfortable as i think you know somebody that doesn't do this kind of stuff yeah would probably be more uncomfortable oh i believe it but the fun thing is fuck up nights why we fear failure like absolutely being marinated in this message of if you don't take risks you don't go anywhere. That's right. You know, big risk, big reward. So I dig it. I dig it. Well, it's going to be very fun to follow along in your journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the Instagram is why we fear failure. Um, website forthcoming, um, building up the social media and everything right now, but, uh, find me on Instagram and I'll keep you informed through that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, one question to close us out. Yeah. It's our go-to. Ah, okay. And that is how do you define what a hustler is like not just a hustle but a hustler sure okay um i feel like there's two different definitions that sort of collided in my head at the same time and there's the hustler that is like always juking and jiving and like always has an angle and that kind of stuff but you know as an entrepreneur i'm i'm surrounded by hustlers that are always looking to build something cool always looking to uh, build their business, build their network, um, build their either financial worth or, uh, personal spiritual self worth. Mm. Um, and I like the term hustle as far as being creative with it too. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, if your hustle is going to college, uh, for a four year degree and then going to grad school and becoming an engineer, you're going to be successful, but I wouldn't call that hustling. Sure. Um, I feel like a hustle is always uh, almost somebody that is um, starting from a bit of a underdog position, mm. and they're they're scrapping and they're getting creative and they're um, very aware of their uh, resources and potential different angles of saying like, "All right, I'm not going to get to point A to point B the simple way or the traditional way." Mm but goddamn, I'm going to figure out how to get there. Mm. Like, I feel like a hustler is a person that has that mindset that, um, I'm going to find the, the creative, unique 
authentic to them ways of getting from point A to point B. Love that. So, you know, like I said, there's there's that other definition of somebody that's just grifting. But um, I feel like a true hustler, especially in the entrepreneurial sense, is somebody that uh, is more goal driven. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Love that. Well, thank you so much, my friend. I greatly appreciate sitting down with you for the pod. Uh, before we close out, anything else you wanted to shout out? I know you mentioned the uh, the Instagram earlier. Uh, maybe you can drop that one more time. Anything else yeah. you wanted to say or mention? The floor is yours. All right. Um, the personal Instagram is probably going to have more of the travel pictures and stories and stuff. And that's Have You Met Micah Yet? Um, M-I-C-A-H. Uh, but the professional one, Why We Fear Failure... Um, should be pretty easy to remember and spell. Uh, and that is going to have uh, a lot of the more scientific, philosophical content on it. But then as I start traveling, um, it's going to have uh, travel stories and information, um, more cultural aspects. Uh, I'll have reels of the podcasts. And then I'm also in the process of uh, developing a website that is going to have the podcast published to it. Very cool. So every time I interview somebody, it should be... Uh, published as soon as possible awesome awesome i love that all right well for everyone that made it to the end of the show i actually want to ask a bonus question yeah love a good bonus. what is what is a, a strategy people can use or actually you know what let me take that back <clears throat> rather than make a pure strategy base i want to leave it a little bit more open-ended what's something that has really stood out to you in terms of your pursuit of understanding failure just as a whole that you immediately lit up and smiled about. I want to know what that thought is as it relates <laughs> to failure. Um, the I think the smile is because like it's it's just failing. It's like why do you resonate with the message of failure? It's because you know I've been dragged face down through the <laughs> dirt uh, a number of times, and yet somehow I still managed to get up and dust myself off and keep driving ahead. Mm. And um, I think I almost have like a, a humorous perspective of it now of like getting knocked down and then getting back up and then getting knocked down and getting back up and still having that drive to move forward. Um, so it's resiliency for sure. It's the comfort with discomfort. Mm. Like, dude, I'm, I, I bought a one-way ticket to Tokyo. I have four nights in a hostel booked and I don't know what the hell is happening after that. Like, it's so it's so exciting, but it's so uncomfortable. You know, I'm I'm giving up uh, two or three years of developing friendships here. I'm giving two or three years of being single. Um, like I'm I'm really casting myself into the ether and just like, all right, well, I know I can take a punch. So so what we're gonna go what see could what be happens. worse, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, and I, I think that you know, over time building that resiliency and, and seeing the incredible value of the resiliency, um, even though it's so uncomfortable, is the reason that I'm attracted now to repeatedly getting myself into organizations or into hustles around fear of failure. Yeah. Because the more I learn, the more I'm like, man, this this can be condensed and shared in some really cool, interesting, thoughtful ways. Absolutely. And I would take us down a tangent, but I said it was just going <laughs> to be that bonus question. But thank you again, my friend. Yeah, I uh, look forward to uh, seeing your journey. I appreciate it. No, this is great. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks.